For this talk in particular, I would really like to thank our partners from, from BSO because uh, they allowed us publishing, which uh, I, I think is really an exceptional thing to do, especially when it comes to, to the topic of tamper resistance and tamper evidence. And I would also like to thank my uh, colleague Johannes Obermeier. We have been really working a lot on this topic, so we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to present the paper here today. So uh, the physical security challenge we are always talking about looks like this. You have a box, and the attacker can come from any direction, uh, do any sorts of stuff, use any tool, any time, and any technique to get inside that box and extract the secret. So uh, this really makes it uh, difficult to, to, I mean, protect from, from all these threats. And there is a talk that I really like, and I'm not sure if he's in the audience, but it's a talk by Venti Nikov, uh, who presented this at Cardis 2016. It's called Security Outside the Black Box Model. And there is a figure that, that really in, inspired me. Um, and uh, this is uh, kind of a, a traffic light system. So you have uh, green for we're all good, red for not so good. And then he looked at various topics. So if we look at the top, we see protecting uh, hardware crypto implementations in the gray box model against side channels, fault attacks, combined attacks, coupling, and reverse engineering. And we see from, from green, that goes to yellow, orange, uh, some other color, and red. And uh, then he looks into various other uh, topics. So I, I think this is uh, really um, kind of the, the agenda we need to look into uh, in, in the future. So how to turn these, these red boxes to a green box. And of course, we uh, might start uh, someone, uh, somewhere up here and, uh, and work on this topic. But of course, uh, as a young, desperate uh, PhD student, we thought like, okay, let's start at the bottom. Uh, protecting any platform in the white box model against physical attacks. Of course, we should at least try. I'm not guaranteeing, uh, I do not guarantee that we succeeded, but uh, at least we should somehow try. So uh, if we talk about security enclosures, we can think of this as some kind of access denial system. So the goal is always to detect and counteract any type of physical attack. So we have the tamper detection, which is uh, basically a tripwire pro to use some sensors for that. Then you have the tamper response that you initiate, and then you have the zeroization, which is some kind of self-destruct sequence of your device. So either you blow some fuses, or you wipe the volatile memory holding the critical security parameters. And for that to work, you typically have uh, battery-backed uh, mechanisms for providing this continuous uh, protection, such that even if the device is powered off, that the sensing still continues to work. So some uh, commercial examples for that are, uh, for instance, the ADP uh, Gausselmann uh, database module. So that's a, uh, a German company uh, providing this uh, module for slot machines um, to ensure or prevent tax fraud. Then we have the uh, HP Atala module, which is a FIPS certified hardware security module uh, at levels uh, three and four. And then this is kind of my favorite, this uh, real masterpiece of uh, security. It's called the IBM Cryptographic Code Processor featuring the so-called GORE envelope. And uh, all, uh, across all these uh, commercial examples, what we see is, is active meshes, obfuscation, light sensors, switches, potting. So all sorts of things to really make it secure. But of course, it's uh, uh, more in the domain of, of, of um, black box uh, modeling. So uh, what they also have in common, uh, you can see it perhaps here, uh, there's a battery and there's a battery and here would have been a battery but I took them out before I did the analysis. So uh, if we look at high level goals of these actual uh, access denial systems, uh, we see uh, there are always a trade off between producibility, usability and security. So of course we can uh, look at very complex manufacturing processes, uh, but then the uh, usability and the security uh, might be impacted or it might be very expensive. But um, in general, they tend to be expensive anyway, so what uh, most people look at is the desired level of security for these access denial systems, and uh, typically they want that there is no way to somehow circumvent the security mechanism. So uh, what you achieve, um, when using these access denial systems is that uh, you're secure in the field, you prevent all physical attacks in the field, but of course also you prevent hardware trojans in the distribution chain. So if you uh, send your device somewhere, you can be quite sure that it has not been tampered with. So um, uh, when we apply 
these criteria to the previous shown examples, uh, then when it comes to producibility, um, we, we saw uh, this, this envelope from the IBM uh, hardware security module. Uh, there the manufacturing is quite complex, but it provides the highest uh, geometrical security because your device is, is fully enclosed. Uh, if we look at covers and shelves, they're of course less complex, but also less secure. Uh, then uh, in terms of usability, the, the battery really uh, um, makes an impact because it typically limits the operating range with regard to temperature. The shelf life, of course, is also limited and uh, usually requires additional service uh, to maintain the batteries if you just shelf the device. And from a security perspective, what is quite interesting, since all these devices run from a battery, you need to be really energy uh, preserving in the sensing that you do. And uh, this typically leads to a rather crude uh, measurement resolution of the, the sensors and circuits that you use. Uh, they are also a little bit more prone to a single point of failure at the PCB level. So you just cut off the alarm or a fake check, uh, apply some fake check signal, and then you get past that. And it's a security mostly based on a black box model. So how can we do better? Uh, so what if I told you these machines no longer need a battery? and we can do without them. And even better yet, we can do it in a white box model. So let's have a look at that. And to no one's surprise, it's based on tamper evident puffs as the uh, proposed alternative. If you'd ask me, but of course I'm slightly biased, uh, that's the true purpose of a puff. It's not key storage, it's, it's tamper detection without having battery backed sensors. So if we power on the device, we do the key derivation from the tamper evident puff enclosure. And if it fails, uh, we have our goal achieved. We could still initiate further countermeasures. And if it succeeds, we at least are reasonably assured that uh, no one tampered with the system and we can unlock the critical security parameters or decrypt the system. Uh, unfortunately, there's very little public work in this area, which is why I would like to encourage you to have a look at this and uh, make it even better. But still, it's a move towards a white box puff design without diminishing the security. So the whole idea is we can publish the architecture and um, such that people can check the concept, um, which is the white box approach to do without diminishing the security. Of course, we can still throw in a little bit of obfuscation, uh, which still makes it even more difficult to attack. So the proof of concept that we did is uh, here you see to the right, it's a flex PCB cover about 14 times 14 centimeters. And uh, the architecture looks like this. We have different domains. So one we call the physical domain, then we have the analog domain, the digital domain, and the application domain. So um, um, th these are separated in, in two units uh, just because of the reason we uh, didn't do any customized uh, circuitry. So we use commercial off-the-shelf components. So we have what is called the evaluation unit and the host system. And what we will focus on here is primarily the evaluation unit where we do capacitance measurement, integrity detection, and some other stuff that is going to be explained as part of the next slide. So the design goals and security objectives that we wanted to achieve with that is to investigate how far can we get just using commercial off the shelf components. Also to check the validity of the concept and if it's worth uh, developing further and investing more money on it. Um, also, um, shifting the scope of the protection mechanism such that we make the physical integrity check as complex as possible and bury it deep inside the AC such that just PCB level tampering no longer works. And what we also wanted to achieve is a concept that scales with future advancements in, in, in manufacturing. The security objectives, uh, simply put, are uh, deny physical access, uh, the disassembly must be uh, destructive, we want the attacker to uh, make multiple holes to circumvent the security mechanism, maximize the distance from enclosure surface to the insides of the targeted uh, chip. The entropy loss uh, upon attack should be substantial, of course, such that it's not possible to reconstruct uh, the secret from the remainder what the attacker might, uh, might extract. Uh, increase the need for customized tooling and the considered diameter is 300 micron, which is um, at least back then when we did this work in line with the security certifications from common criteria and FITS and so on. So if we look at the uh, layer stack up that we have um, in, in this cover that I uh, showed to you um, uh, on the previous slide, so we have uh, five metal layers and uh, those that are re really relevant are the shields, the, the so-called uh, TX electrodes, RX electrodes and the other shield. And between these electrodes, there's a mutual capacitance <laughs> Um, and uh, 
since there is a mesh that I will show in the next slide and the um, intrinsic manufacturing variations, this mutual capacitance is, is our puff. So on a, on a logical level, uh, how it looks like is uh, we have our cover, and then this is like, like a matrix with uh, 16 uh, RX electrodes, 16 TX electrodes, and uh, the opposite end of these electrodes are uh, routed back to the circuit uh, to allow more advanced uh, sensing. So the me uh, sensor mesh concept looks like this. We always have these uh, two pairs of electrodes that are being, being routed um, on one layer and also on the other layer, and then we have these small overlaps. And due to the etching process, we have a little bit of, of, of under etching and impurities of the material. And if you measure precisely enough, uh, then you see that there is in, indeed variation. So it's uh, purely intrinsic uh, variation from the PCB manufacturing. So the stochastic model for that is, is really simple. All tiny uh, overlaps, all tiny track overlaps behave like uh, capacitors in parallel. This mutual capacitance has a nominal offset, which we call CN, and then we have this variation CV, uh, which is, is really, really, really small compared to the uh, nominal uh, value. So what we need is a really high resolution um, differential measurement to uh, cancel out the uh, common offset uh, CN and just uh, extract the variation CV. So uh, we built an analog uh, and digital uh, measurement circuit um, th this is the, the measurement uh, the chain, so from left to right we have some excitation signal, um, which is uh, two uh, antiphasic signals that combine in the cover, and then we have uh, a complex current as a result that is the representative for the uh, differential capacitance, and then we process that further and sample it again in the IC. So uh, we have different uh, measurements. Uh, of a different nature such that they complement each other and um, just tricking one measurement won't do the job. So you would have as an attacker trick all the various measurements, which in this case is an absolute capacitance measurement measuring the mutual capacitance, the differential um, uh, capacitance measurement and the integrity check just to see if uh, there's an open or short circuit in the electrodes. Applications for that are uh, for the integrity to do rapid uh, measurements and the factory initialization for the differential measurement to do the key generation and on the fly rate and range limits, and for the absolute measurement um, to do additional tamper detection and it could also be used as a temperature sensor. So the whole bo boot process looks like this. We have the power on event, then our device is running. Uh, we check if uh, the uh, electrodes are broken somehow. Uh, we start the measurement circuit. Uh, fr from the same set of uh, data that we acquired, we do the key generation. At the same time, we, we start some runtime de uh, temper detection systems that limit the rate of change and the uh, range of values. And then in addition to that, we check if the absolute capacitance value uh, differ too much from what we expect. And of course, then we uh, continuously repeat these uh, measurements and start decrypting the system. And if everything uh, is okay, then we can start using the system. So basic statistics uh, have been uh, acquired from a set of 115 flex PCB covers at uh, almost constant environmental conditions, so constant voltage, uh, AC control room, and so on. And the uh, differential capacitance and the PDF we get for that uh, somehow matches our expectation, not perfectly, but reasonably close enough. And for the absolute capacitance measurement, we see that there is uh, some, some variation for each of these uh, sensor nodes that we build as part of our mesh. But uh, these uh, sm small crosses uh, always appear in pairs. So indeed neighboring uh, electrode pairs have the same offset. So uh, the overall uh, message here is that the data is in line with the expectations and the low noise uh, measurement that we have is essential for this type of application. Now, when we look at the entropy and the puff assessment, on a global level, we uh, can do Shannon entropy over the whole puff population. Then the entropy per measurement node we get at first is, is relatively high at room temperature. But if we account for the temperature drift and everything, then of course we need to reduce uh, the entropy that we extract. Um, then I was talking about the uniqueness uh, over uh, different uh, distance metrics. So this is the uniqueness over uh, Hamming distance for uh, symbols or higher order alphabets. So it's no longer centered around 50% because if you have bits, 
the best case we can have is that 50% uh, of your bit string changes, but if you have symbols and a higher order alphabet, then uh, the number of symbols that should change is, is much higher depending on the size of the alphabet. So this is just showcasing the uniqueness for the changed symbols, and this is the uniqueness for combined symbols and magnitude. And as we can see here, there's uh, still room for improvement because not all the symbols change um, uh, all the time and not uh, half of the uh, maximum possible magnitude. So this is a rather strong uh, uniqueness metric that we uh, impose on ourselves, which is uh, unfortunate because the pl plot does not look so nice. Um, so if you look at uniqueness for tamper evident puff, really start looking uh, beyond panning distance over binary res responses. Uh, something else that we did is a more localized entropy assessment uh, for which we use a spatial context tree weighting. So here we wanted to investigate the spatial entropy dependency. So you make a, you make a hole in the cover and then as an attacker you're given all the information around it uh, based on a, a different radius. And what we see here is that the entropy is lower than what we saw beforehand. So indeed there is a degradation that exists due to the crude layout and the PCB process, but we already have a way of, of fixing that. So this is a, a rather strong uh, attack uh, for, for the attacker. And uh, of course uh, that's the, the strongest possible attack anyway that the attacker gets the, the, the puff output and um, yeah, that's work uh, together with um, Michael Keo of TU Munich that, is, uh, that still needs to be published. We also have uh, more data, more attacks, and more environmental uh, tests in the paper. It's just way too much to present it in any useful way as, 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 as part of this talk. So here we did some temperature tests, some x-rays, and also attacks uh, on the cover. So uh, the conclusion is uh, this is still just only a, a very tiny step towards uh, access denial systems uh, without a battery. And uh, we definitely need this full stack approach to, to get the tamper evident properties and uh, just using commercial off the shelf components has its limits, especially regarding uh, repairs that the attacker can perform. Uh, the development of these access denial systems in a white box model I think is, is very challenging, but I hope it can be solved uh, during the next uh, years. And as always, we use a layered approach to security, so it wouldn't make any sense to use an access denial system and not protect against side channels uh, on the circuit level itself. So uh, future work is um, regarding l uh, layout randomization because the layer that we used was fixed. So what we can uh, do here is just to artificially increase the number of electrode pairs and then uh, before the measurement recombine them based on a challenge that you select. And uh, here this uh, concept of challenge response naturally translates to to layout randomization where you also break up local dependencies. So if uh, this puff would be built, then the uh, spatial context tree weighting would yield uh, better results. Another thing that could be done is to customize the PDF so we could uh, some kind of impregnate uh, uh, different uh, nominal values without changing uh, CV. And uh, right now we have only been working on, on a Gaussian distribution, but uh, there are some ideas how to change that to a bimodal or arbitrary PDF for which the equidistant quantization approach again is the better choice because you don't rely on the, on the shape of your PDF. And uh, something else is uh, of course to tailor the materials to increase CV and reduce CN to improve the local entropy loss and of course make repairs more difficult. And there are many more things that need to be done and I, I, I really hope to see uh, progress uh, in that domain. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, thank you uh, again very much and uh, see my updated contact information and uh, ready for questions. So we have time probably for only one question. Which slide, say again, please? Oh, that, that, that one. Yeah, so um, the slides will be available online, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn and uh, yeah, just send me a message. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Um, be before closing this session, I would like to announce that today we have also a poster session and we have 10 posters. 
Um, if you like, you can join us at Augusto Ballroom at 7th floor uh, at 6 p.m. Thank you.